giving this lecture about entanglement and quantum field theory. As, okay, as the title says, I will talk about entanglement, quantum field theory. I understand that the background here is very vast, so many of you are not familiar with uh, uh, some of these concepts. Yet, in uh, three lectures of two hours, I cannot make an introduction of quantum field theory because it will be not enough. So I will just try to organize some lecture in such a way that will be, let's say, at least decent for both the expert and non-expert in the field so that everyone can learn something. Uh, clearly, I'm happy to eventually renormalize the lecture if I have some feedback that it's too easy or too difficult. Uh, the overall structure will be that uh, today will be quite easy. Just I will explain what is entanglement in many body systems, why it's important, etc. Next lecture will get a bit more difficult when we start using a bit of quantum field theory, but okay. I will just give you some ingredients that you need without saying where did they come from. Some of you may know where these ingredients come from. Some of you just, uh, they have to believe me when I take as axiom of, uh, of our uh, uh, calculation. Okay, and the last lecture probably will be a bit harder for, uh, for the non-expert, but okay. Eventually, uh, depending on your feedback, we can try to uh, get it somewhere, okay? So, what are we are going to talk about? The main subject is entanglement in quantum field theory, and if you want, and in many body systems. Okay, as uh, you all know, entanglement is a characteristic feature of quantum mechanics. Uh, you have studied probably at undergraduate, and usually it's uh, a property that is connected when it's studied at undergrad student with the behavior of a uh, few particles, like you say that one spin is entangled with another spin, and you know if you make a measurement somewhere, you get an outcome that can influence the measure everywhere else. Still, what well, then it has to do with uh, many body system, okay? And to understand this, let's try to understand in general what is the, the structure of entanglement in, uh, in a given quantum state, okay? So we imagine to have a, okay, let's start. With a pure state, and I will try I will mainly focus on pure state during this lecture because, okay, time is what it is. A pure state psi. And, okay, this state psi belongs to some Hilbert space H that I assume can be factorized as the tensor product of two different space, HA times HB, okay? And the overall idea is that you have an Hilbert space and there is an observer that usually traditionally is called Alice that can, measure, me can make measurements only in the part A of the system, while there is another observer traditionally called Bob, which can have access only to the complement of A. Okay, so overall this is the total space and there is, uh, and Hilbert space can be written as a tensor product of HA tensor HB in this way. Okay. Now, there is a, uh, there is a standard Theorem in linear algebra, which is called Schmidt decomposition, which many of you have studied already at undergrad, but I will just repeat here. Schmidt decomposition guarantees that psi 
can be written as sum over alpha, lambda alpha, W A alpha, tensor product, W B alpha, where W alpha A is a basis of the Hilbert space HA, while W alpha B is a basis How many of you know this theorem? Okay, so there is not much to all of you know. Just for the very few that didn't hear before, keep in mind that uh, the basis here, the tenter in the, in the Schmidt decomposition depends on the state itself, okay? The Schmidt decomposition ensures for, that for any state it exists a basis such that the state can be written in this way, okay? But the state depends on, the, uh, the basis depends on the state. So it's not that there is one general basis where this can be written that will be clearly wrong, okay? Just as a reminder, but you seem to be very familiar with this concept already. Uh, yes, sorry, especially for you that are there, it's, I will, thank you. I hope I don't have to rewrite what Thank you for. Now, you see from this expression now that already entanglement starts popping up because if this is. If there is only one lambda alpha equal to one, okay? By the way, I forgot to say lambda alpha should be such that sum of lambda alpha square is equal to one because of normalized. See if you want the state to be normalized. If psi is, okay, but this is just triviality. Okay, so if there is only one of these coefficients equal to one, the state psi is a tensor product, and this means that there is no entanglement between A and B. Contrarily, if many lambda alpha are different from zero, the state psi cannot be written as a tensor product, okay? If many lambda alpha are different from zero, the state psi cannot be written as a tensor product. And then we will say that psi is entanglement. between 
A and B. Okay, so the, what we conclude from this very brief uh, discussion about the Smith decomposition is that the, the presence of these non eigenvalues being non zero signal the presence of entanglement. Now, there is first a very important observation, which I want that you get in your mind now for both the rest of this lecture and hopefully forever, that the entang you will read papers, especially people that are working on this subject, saying, oh, the entanglement in the state is that, that, and that, and maybe you have written paper already with the statement which in some sense is correct, but it's also wrong at the same time, and, uh, because the entanglement is a property, yes, of the state, but also of the bipartition that you make on the state. So you take a state psi, and you consider a given bipartition of the Hilbert space. Okay? So in the state and in the partition, you have some entanglement. that is encoded in this lambda alpha, and now we will try to make even something better out of it. But I can very well find another bipartition in the, of the same state where there is no entanglement, okay. Or I can find uh, uh, one bipartition where the entanglement is big and another one where the entanglement is small. Okay, so the entanglement is a property not only of the state, but also of the bipartition. Okay, so don't, uh, it's trivial, I know, from the introduction just uh, but then uh, many people forget this and just start discussing that state is entangled and many other stories that, okay. If you have two spins, obviously there is only one bipartition. <laughs> you cannot divide in a different way. But if you start having 10 of them, okay, just uh, you, you see very easily that there are many possible bipartitions. Okay, so this is a very important observation and I hope that uh, you will not forget. Then, we can continue and trying to get something more quantitative because just from this mid decomposition we arrive to the point that we are able to distinguish whether a state is entangled or not. But we are uh, physicists, we like uh, to measure things and we don't want just yes or no. Okay? This is, uh, we would like to know, characterize if I have one state and one partition with, that is written like that, then another state and another partition that is written uh, similarly, uh, to know if there is more entanglement in one case or in the other. Okay? These are the kind of questions we are wondering. So we want to go through a measure of entanglement. Okay? So what we are, we are, we are going for a measure. By the way, I didn't ask you before, maybe I should have asked, how many of you know how to measure the entanglement? Okay, compared to Smith decomposition, the number really went down, so <laughs> this uh, introduction is really needed. Uh, okay, so to do so, let's start by introducing the, let's introduce the reduce density matrix. This is the most important concept for defining the entanglement entropy. We shall define as rho A equal 
to the trace over HB of the density matrix rho. And the density matrix rho for a pure state, you need to be just the projector on the state itself. Rho A equals trace over HB of rho. 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 Wait. Rho is projector on psi. Psi, psi. Ah, you don't read down here. This is the. Is too low? The density matrix for the entire system is just the projector on the state. Okay, let's write everything here also. Rho A, this is the most important formula, is the trace over B of rho. And usually this is shorted as trace over B of rho, not trace over HB. This is, so. this is a short for the same thing, okay? Okay, now, if you take this mid decomposition and you plug into that formula, okay, it's a very simple exercise. You can try that since these objects are or orthogonal, you get the trace over rho A is sum over alpha, lambda alpha squared, W. Uh -huh. Okay. is the sum of the projector on this basis weighted with the square of the Schmidt eigenvalues. Okay, so before getting to this definition of the entanglement, I want to observe another thing that I could analogously define the reduced density matrix of the part B of the system as the trace over A over rho. Okay? And if I write in the Schmidt basis this guy, this is the sum over alpha, lambda alpha square W B alpha W B alpha and the fact that the form of the two reduced density matrix is, is the same show once again that the entanglement is a reciprocal property between A and B and not a property just of, uh, of the state. Still, you see that already this formula has uh, something that often gets uh, overlooked, okay? HA and HB can be extremely different spaces. I can imagine to have a state, I don't know, done by, let's imagine Psi is a state of 300 spins or qubit, call as you want, depending on which language you like. I can bipartite this thing in many, in many different ways. In particular, I can make 150 and 150. And then the two Hilbert space will have the same dimension. But I can even bipartite the system in such a way that HA corresponds to one spin, for example, and HB to 299. In this case, HA and as dimension 
few, while HB has dimension Q to the 299, with no surprise, 2 to the 2 to 99 is much larger than 2. Okay, this everyone should know. Still, the reduced density matrix can be written exactly in the same way. So, in this case, let's see if you are getting something what I'm telling. How many lambda alpha can at most be different from uh, zero? Hmm? Okay. So, and then what does it mean that you meet decomposition? I have two lambda alpha different from zero, okay? So I have, uh, let's say A is the one of dimension two. Okay, so the other sum over one, alpha goes from one to two of these two guys, and two, two states are obviously a basis for a one qubit. What about the other half? I mean, the other uh, half that is much bigger than half for the B part. Yeah, it's, there are two eigenvalues that are non-zero, and then the other two to the 298. I didn't hear. Yeah, but I say that Schmidt decomposition that is a theorem proved by this mathematician Schmidt in 1850 say that it's a basis. And the space of dimension 2 to the 299 is cannot be written a base of uh, two. Where are the other two to 298 states? Clear what I mean, no? We said it's a basis, okay, it's a theorem, it's written even on Wikipedia, if you don't trust me. It's, it's the source of all the culture of nowadays, Wikipedia, so if it isn't there, it must be true. Uh, obviously, it's a tricky question. <laughs> That's, Okay, it means that you can, in the remaining part of the Hilbert space, you can choose whatever basis. They will have just taken value zero, and any basis is okay. So this is always the case. But the point is, this object that at first sounds trivial, it's adding a lot of zero eigenvalues, and the, the eigenvector in the kernel can be important for something. Don't forget that they exist. Okay? This is... Uh, This is something that often brings to uh, proving wrong theorems, so don't forget that they exist something else. So in general, for example, this sum alpha that you never find specified, you can write it right. Alpha runs from one to the minimum between the dimension of HA and dimension of HB, okay? We say this once, alpha goes from alpha to the minimum of this two dimension, and we will not say anymore. Okay, but keep in mind and that for the larger system, but also for the other, okay, there can be zero again values everywhere. So it's, Let's go back that we were searching for a measure of entanglement, and we see, we have said that from this definition, from the Smith decomposition, sorry, we see that the, the entanglement is encoded in this coefficient lambda alpha, and the intuition tells us that the, the most coefficient, more coefficient lambda alpha are different from zero, more entanglement there is. This would be the intuition, okay? Obviously, lambda alpha itself doesn't matter too much, should be the absolute value of the object that matters, because you can always rotate this guy. 
And keeping in mind that sum over lambda alpha squared is equal to 1, as we already said, we can interpret, not we can interpret, we know that lambda alpha squared is just the probability that uh, the subsystem A is in the state given by this basis. Okay. So a measure of how much the state can be uh, of the answers, uh, or how much we don't know where in which basis is the state in the subsystem, can be the entropy minus sum over lambda alpha square log lambda alpha square. Okay, this is a probability, so you can always define this entropy, which is nothing that minus trace of rho a log rho a which is also, since lambda alpha corresponds both to rho a and rho b, minus trace of rho b log rho b. Let's put parentheses and uh, we avoid all dubs. Okay, this is the definition of von Neumann entropy, okay? No, you may know it. So this quantity, trace of rho a log rho a, or equivalently trace of rho b rho b, is usually called usually called entanglement entropy. Okay. Which is the, the measure of entropy we were searching for. The measure of entanglement we were searching for. Now, I I don't want much to insist on why mathematically that object is a good measure of entanglement, because this will bring us in a detour in quantum information theory that neither is my expertise, nor probably is what you want to know, just to, first of all, I want to tell you what is the official story. Okay, and then people interested in it can uh, go to original literature or to Wikipedia again. Uh, yes, you must know that quantum information theory has wonderful Wikipedia pages, while physics has very horrible Wikipedia pages, so this is probably fault of the PhD students because Wikipedia pages are in the hands of PhD students. So then, uh, uh, in quantum information theory, one say that the entanglement entropy, okay, the entanglement entropy that we define there is an entanglement monotone. Okay, so the entanglement monotone, let's write it bigger. This is nothing but an equivalent way of saying that is a good measure of entanglement. And it's a good measure of entanglement because okay, the definition of entanglement monotony is such that it does not increase, and that's why monotone, under L-O-C-C. 
And LOCC means local operation and classical communication. Okay, so this is the definition. I don't want to enter too much in this story, just give you a, an idea of how the, the thing work. Okay? If I want to measure, if I want to have a measure of entanglement, I should mean what does it mean, measure of entanglement, okay? And the people in quantum information got this idea of entanglement monotone, okay? And more or less, to give a very rough uh, explanation is that okay, you cannot really say if the entanglement is three, four, five of one state and one bipartition, what you can give is an order between the entanglement of different states and bipartition. Okay? It's not like, um, obviously I have this table that measures probably two meters, so two meter and a half, okay? And uh, I have uh, this chalk that is much shorter, okay? For the entanglement, you cannot say that this guy is really absolutely one-tenth of that, but you can say that definitely this chalk is shorter than the, the table. Okay, so there is a monotonic, well, there are some objects that are called entanglement monotone, which tells you if one state in a given bipartition is more entangled than another. So it's a property of a state in a given bipartition. You understand the logic? Just I don't want to question at this point. Because yeah, 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 I will like, yes, this is, first of all, I will tell you a bit better, again, at the same level of what I'm telling now, but okay, the first point is, I don't have an absolute measure of entanglement, okay? I can have several measures, okay? All of that are monotone in the sense that they provide an order between state. Okay, so if I have that, if I have, so I have an Hilbert space with a given bipartition, okay? So I should start with this, this is how things are well defined. Don't compare in quantum information state with different bipartition, this is not part of the game. Okay, this is important for condensed matter, but not in the other game, okay? So I have this bipartition. Then I have two states, psi and phi belonging to H, okay? I can make, what I can tell is whether the entanglement of psi is greater or equal than the entanglement of phi, okay? And this, I can use this entanglement monotone. If I found in one monotone that this relation is true, this should be true in, for all the entanglement monotone. Okay, sometimes with someone can be equal and someone does not, but there is this idea of ordering. Okay? But then in one case, one can be the double, in one case, one can be 200 times more. The scale is not defined at all. Okay, so this is the idea of monotone. It's a monotonic relation between the entanglement of the state in a given partition. Yes? Yes, sure, sure, but this is not... Okay, I'm telling you why the von Neumann entropy is a measure of entanglement. Then we discuss what else you can do with that. I'm trying to convince you at least then. Uh... Okay, and this ordering of state, according to the people that developed this theory, okay, that are uh, many people in quantum information, okay, is that any entanglement model should not increase under LOCC, local operation and classical communication. And what local operation and classical communication means, it's the name itself that tells you, you had this state with the B partition A and B, Local operations are those objects that act only in A or in B, okay? It's clear that if I have one state and I make some local operation in A or in B, I cannot increase the entanglement. I should make something between A and B to increase it. 
Hmm? A local operation can be a unitary uh, restricted to A or to B, and in that case, you expect the entanglement does not move at all, but you can make a measurement, for example, in A, and in this case, you can bring down the entanglement to zero, no? Clear? You can make a measurement of uh, all the observable in A, the, the, uh, the state will be projected in one of the uh, Smith bases, the entanglement will be automatically at zero, but in fact, it didn't increase. But when it's obvious that ma making something only in A or only in B, I cannot increase the entanglement, okay? That's the, it's obvious. It's the definition from the mathematical point of view, but the physical intuition tells us that uh, this is what we want, no? Clear to everyone? Classical communication on the other end is, as an operation, is a bit more complicated. I don't want to enter in uh, uh, what it is, but it's the famous part when you discuss about um, uh, EPR paradox. You know that there are these two states that are entanglement. You make a measure here, and you discover that immediately on the moon, uh, the state is in, uh, your spin is in another state. How this is compatible with causality? It's compatible with causality because to know that something happened on the moon, you need some classical communication that tells you what happened in the moon. Okay, that was the, the explanation of the uh, EPR paradox, the accepted explanation according to quantum mechanics, and that part of the, that famous phone call in the, that is telling you what happened on the moon is the part of the classical communication, okay? So you need, if you, a is a spin on the R, and B is a spin on the moon. It's true that as soon as you make the measurement on the R, on the moon, something went differently. But in order for the people on the moon to know that you made the measurement, you have to tell them. And this takes some uh, classical communication to do it. Okay, that's, you knew this explanation, no? Rise the end, who knew the explanation? Okay. Not as many. I would expect, okay. You know, this, you, who knows the EPR paradox? Please, all oh, rise the your hand. Okay, so. You know the EPR paradox, and the solution I just told you is that, uh, what Einstein didn't like, the solution is that in order for the other observer that didn't make the measure to know that the state must be in one state and is not yet in superposition, is that you need to communicate the other person that you make a measurement. Because until you make the measurement, he doesn't know, okay? Even when you make the measurement, the other observer doesn't know. You have to communicate him. This communication, which is not within classical mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics, but it's a classical communication. Things must be done, take some time, because it cannot go faster than the speed of light, and this is the explanation why there is no paradox in the EPR protocol. Okay, this kind of operation, quantum mechanics are called classical communication, and also under this classical communication, the entanglement, we expect that should not increase, because we are doing something classical, so we cannot change the entanglement, okay? The, the reasoning why it's obvious, but what is more complicated is to give uh, an operation in the, an operational sense to this classical communication, but I will not enter, it's just telling you as a very reasonable story, okay? Is the story reasonable to you? Yes. Hmm? Okay, <laughs> okay, this is, yeah, there are way out of this, but it takes. It's not? I think one is not local. Oh, it's local, it's... Okay, you can make, I understand that quantum mechanics, the one we are discussing here, et cetera, is not relativistic, but okay, you can make relativistic quantum mechanics, which is quantum field theory, and okay, you can make everything uh, fitting in that, and still, the entanglement is there. But okay, this will take a, a longer way, but... Uh, the only thing, okay, I don't want to discuss EPR parallels, I want just to discuss 
My main point is that the entanglement entropy is an entanglement monotone according to this definition. This can be proved, okay? I will not even show the proof. Okay, so we have this concept of ordering between uh, states, and the entanglement entropy respect this property. That's my main message, and I want that this is clear. Then, if you want to discuss aside or between you all the other implication, very welcome, but okay, we will not, uh, will not go anywhere if we start discussing this too much. Okay, is this clear? By the way, for the, for the rest of the lecture and also for and also to make contact uh, with what is nowadays done in the literature, not only the entanglement entropy defined as, okay, so there we have trace of rho A log rho A is a good measure of entanglement. The, the Rényi entropy, that probably are less known, less known concepts, Rényi entropies. Who knows Rényi entropies here? They became very popular. It's, remember, like five years ago, I was making lecture about the entanglement entropies, and no one knew Rényi entropies. Now, switch completely. The Rényi entropy are defined just as a of order n is 1 divided 1 minus n log of trace of rho a to the n, okay? This is a modification of that formula for, if you take the limit for n that goes to 1 of this object, obviously you find the entanglement entropy that we defined before, but it's a one parameter family of uh, one parameter families of entropy, and all of them are good entanglement models. So all of them are good measure of entanglement. Still, there are physical reasons to prefer the entanglement entropy that I'm not sure we will discuss during this lecture, depending on how times go and what we, what we do. Any of you has some uh, idea why, obviously not the people working in the field because they should know, but for the other people, any of you have a, some idea why entanglement entropy means von Neumann entropy is better than Rennie? Okay, there is no reason from the point of view of entanglement since they are all good entanglement motons, so there should be some other reason. Hmm? No, computation is the other way around. We introduce Rennie because we are able to make computation and measurement. Instead, for Neumann entropy is more complicated, both to measure and to measure in experiment, especially. We are still not able to measure in experiment entanglement entropy, by the way. Only the Rennie version. Okay, let's extend the question to the expert. One of the experts tell me why, not Marcello, obviously, <laughs> one of the junior experts. Okay, probably people are scared to say why. Uh, okay? To my, one of the main property of the entanglement entropy that the Rényi entropy does not is the so-called strong subadditivity. For Neumann entropy, satisfy 
strong tube additivity while Renai not a strong subadditivity. It means that if I have different bipartition, like I have a one, a two, yeah, okay. So this is a one. There is a, a, another piece a two, and there is the rest. SA1 plus SA2. It's larger or equal than SA1 plus A2. This is not true for Rene. And you see that why this object is important from condensed matter or field theory point of view. There was a question, but first let me tell, finish the. One, the, why this is important? Because this relation allows you even to get some order and ideas when you vary the bipartition, not only the state. Entanglement monotone, it's a property, okay, within a given bipartition. It orders the states okay, given a bipartition. So I cannot, I cannot compare according to quantum information and what it gives us the entanglement entropy in, uh, of a state in one bipartition with one in another bipartition. This is, we do, we will do it many times, but it's not an allowed game within the definition of quantum information. Okay, we should go out of this, uh, of that. And the idea that there is a, this subadditivity that relates entanglement in, of different bipartition provides the, the tool to go through that, okay? So that's why it's very important strong subadditivity, and also it's a physical, it's a very physical thing, so it's, uh, it's important. Okay, there was some question around. I heard a sorry before. No, what? Bigger, strong subadditivity. It's additive, yes. The ex in the, the thermodynamic entropy will be additive, not subadditive. But this is something more, okay? It's part of the game that will be the equal sign for classical object. So when this equality is set, this, uh, sorry, when this, uh, this equality is uh, saturated, it means that you are in a classical state. Or in a thermal state, as we call it, <laughs> often. That's, that's a very good point. Okay, this, is, this is saturated in thermodynamics. But it's not all the, we are talking about one single quantum state that, okay, we didn't even tell what it is. Could have to do with quantum mechanics, with the many body system, or could be just a state that I pick up because I want to play with it. Okay? So, there is no reason why it should satisfy the state, the thermodynamics. Okay? But, obviously, since this is a general relation, should be valid also for thermodynamic state, and in that case, will be saturated. Okay? This is the kind of question that, okay, please do it, because, okay, allow to make contacts of what I'm telling you, what you already know, and that's where you get better, the things, actually. Okay, so to go through these first 50 minutes again, what we say is that, okay, we start from a bipartition of an Hilbert space. We want to measure, to understand a measure of, of the entanglement in this state and in this bipartition. And what I try to motivate you is that this object here, which is called the entanglement entropy, which is... Uh, Extremely important that you know now and uh, you don't forget anymore if you want to com be, continue to be a 
uh, convex matter physicist, okay? It's a good measure of entanglement, and it's even not only a good measure of entanglement, because even the Rényi entropy are a good measure of entanglement, but there's some other physical properties, like the strong subadditivity, which will be very important to make connection with me between entanglement and thermodynamics, that is something very important that I will not do during this lecture, but it's good that you know, okay? So this is the sense of these first 15 minutes. Still, probably, you find, you can still find this quantity a bit uh, abstract, so I want you to show some example of uh, of what it is to make it more down on earth and not just a crazy definition of, of someone. Okay. So, I gave you this definition, and if this definition makes sense, it should first of all make sense in the easiest possible case, which is a two spin state or a two qubit state, okay? So, let's see what happened. For a Okay, let's take a generic, okay, not so generic, a quite entangled state of two qubit. Let me write in this form. Okay, so I take a superposition of the plus minus, uh, minus plus with coefficient cos alpha and sine alpha. If these two coefficients are equal, one over square root of two, which means alpha equal pi over four, this is the EPR pair that uh, you admitted already to know. So, okay? So this is very simple state, and we have, you know that for alpha equal zero, pi over half, et cetera, it's periodic, so I don't go after pi over half. For half, uh, the state is an entire state. S zero is a product state, so I have zero entanglement. It's clear. While I would expect entanglement to be maximal at pi over four, Correct, no? When the two coefficients are equal, it's the maximum uncertainty that we have. You need to motivate more this for thing? No. And I would expect even that between zero and pi over four is monotonous, this entanglement, no? Why should be? And vice versa from pi over four to Pi over two should be, again, monotons, but the decreasing function of alpha, no? That's an expectation, roughly correct. So let's try to calculate the entanglement entropy. First of all, we should get the reduced density matrix. And rho A is just trivial. Will be cos alpha squared, the projector on plus, plus sine alpha squared, projector on the minus state. Okay, you see automatically that when you sum over the minus, you get just cos two uh, of cos alpha, and instead, in the other case, you will get two sine alpha. Okay? Try to make the exercise if you don't see it.
Okay, this, getting this reduced density matrix from that state is an exercise with the 4 by 4 matrix. If you don't know by half, because I'm sure that half of you know, for the other half that never made this exercise, just during the coffee break or the, the lunch break, make the, the calculation. It's very easy. If you get stuck, to just ask of your person on the right or on the left that probably knows it. <laughs> because it's, okay, so, but, but do it because it's, uh, they want to lose the three minutes doing it, and uh, it's important if you don't know that you do it. Given this definition, it's obvious that lambda alpha square then are just cos alpha square and sin alpha square. And then the entanglement entropy, it's just minus cos square alpha log cos square alpha minus you can plot this quantity, maybe you can just ask Mathematica to plot it for you. And if you do so, you got a card that is done like that. The entanglement is zero. In zero is zero in pi over two. It's maximal at pi over four. And the maximum value at pi over four is, you see directly from here, if you put one half here and here, it's one half log one half plus one half log one half, which makes, with the minus sign here, makes log two. Okay, so the maximum entanglement entropy in this case is log two, which, by the way, is the maximum entanglement that you can have between two cube, qubit. Okay, so this. For these very specific states, it's clear that the entanglement entropy makes what it should do. Question at this point? Yes? What do you mean, how you generate? Depends on whatever experiment. These are also, uh, for example, these are standard state in photon. That's how Bell inequality were proved, for example. But there are thousands of ways to, okay, depends on which experiments you have in mind. Uh, come on, we are, nowadays, like for in, uh, cold atom and superconductor, et cetera, there is the possibility to manipulate and uh, play with the, at, at least 50, but hundreds also of uh, spins. Two is just the easiest one. Then, okay, for each system, the, uh, that's why I ask you what you mean, but okay. Uh, for each system will be generated in a different way, but okay, it's really, Not to talk about the fact that when some, like, if a particle decay in two particles, these usually are entangled, and okay, it's not much different from that, <laughs> okay? You have to change basis, etc. cetera, but uh, the overall story is the same. More questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I expect, I said, no, no, the, the intuition tells me that this state is maximally, maximally entangled where the weight between the two parts are the same, no? Because if they are the same, after I make the measurement of one, I have 50-50 probability of getting something. But if the weights are not the same, like this weight is 70%, 0.7, after I make a measurement, I will have 70% of getting something and 30% of something else. Okay, so the, the maximal uh, uncertainty is when the weights are equal. And this I will, I expect that is connected with the maximal entanglement. What do you mean contribution? Yeah, 
have, a, okay, this is, I'm telling. When I have now two spin, forget about all the general thing. I expect the entanglement between the two spin to be maximum when these coefficients are uh, the same. This is something fair enough to say. I'm just, what I'm doing now is sanity check on the measurement that uh, we introduced, okay, to justify that it's a good measure of entanglement. It's not, uh, there's nothing rigorous here, okay? It's, the rigorous part is, okay, I have this definition, entanglement model, I check that the definition satisfies my axiom, and then this is, this is rigorous. But okay, from a physical point of view, this is uh, uh, unsatisfactory. You want to see that your uh, definition match with what you think it's physical. Okay? And for me, this is physical. That, and that's okay. There is no, no way to prove this, <laughs> but the physical is that the entanglement must be maximal where the two things are equal. Okay, this is my expectation. And I, I, people in quantum information, construct a measurement that satisfy this requirement. It's not the other way around, okay? It's not that this is maximal because that object is maximal. That object has been constructed in such a way that is maximal here. If I construct an object that is not, I'm wrong. This is the, what do you mean obvious? You Sorry, uh, a physics, okay, there is physics and there is math. Max is based on axiom that follows something. Okay? Physics is what, okay, you measure what you have. It's, there is no way to define physics. Define physics is that uh, when Galileo let it fall the, the bolts, and that's the same, there is no way. Okay, I construct an object that fits what I know it must be true. And don't change the, the order of the operation. The, the physics come before the math. Then the math must be consistent. I cannot make, okay, I have expectation, and so I make a calculation, one plus one, okay, to fit my expectation should be three. Okay, if you make this, <laughs> the math, your expectation must be consistent with the math that you define. But there are, okay, there are some things that are part of the axiom of your theory, and this you cannot, they should just fit your expectation. And that's what I'm telling. The, this object, the entanglement entropy is an entanglement monotone. Okay, this is part of the math and the axiom. Okay, people decided that a good measure of entanglement should be an entanglement monotone. So this, but this is an axiom. It's not that you can prove it. Huh? This axiom is there because it fits very well what you want that these maths describe. Okay, there is extremely good maths that describe nothing, okay? And we are not talking about that uh, here. So this is, again, sometimes it's confusing, but okay, keep in mind it's the, never forget it. Yeah, but why the entropy measures the entanglement? Obviously, when I say that the entropy measures the entanglement, the value where the entropy is maximal is the maximal entanglement. But okay, who tells you that the entropy measures the entanglement? That's... It's not eggs and chicken, okay? Eggs and chicken, is, you don't know who comes first. Here, you know very well who comes first. Okay, if on the same state you compute the other Rainy entropy, okay, you can make the game and you will find plots that look like this for different alpha. Okay, so. so this is von Neumann, which means alpha equal one, and this object a bit smaller, for example, is alpha equal two, and so, and so are the other, more or less the same shape, and all of them are monotonous function of this alpha, which is expected because there must be good measure of entanglement, okay? I didn't... Ah, and sorry, it's... Uh, this guy here sometimes is referred to n, sometimes is referred to alpha. Ah, no, but alpha is also the angle, so in this case cannot do it. You are right. 
So this is n equal 1 and this is n equal 2. But in the literature, you will find the, the two symbol interchange. But okay. no, in this case, we have already an alpha, so we cannot. Okay, if you don't have any question now, probably it's the right moment to make a small break. And uh, how long usually is the break? Five, ten minutes, five or ten? You want ten, okay. So we reconvene at uh, ten seventeen. So try to enter at ten fifteen, so at ten seventeen we start.
io finisco alle 11. Sì, 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 non lo so. Quindi... Ok, welcome back. Just an observation, one of your fellow reminded me that what I wrote here is just subadditivity and not strong subadditivity. It's true, uh, everything is, what I said was correct, I just gave the wrong name, just this is subadditivity, not strong. Strong subadditivity is that you can add even S A intersection A2, which in the case that I wrote here was, uh, was zero, but okay, in general, strong subadditivity refers to the fact that there is also a term of the intersection, while subadditivity is without that term. They are both true for the entanglement entropy, and none of them is true for the Rényi entropy, so uh, not change, was just a, a miswording. Okay. Uh, did you think to any other question in the meantime, or I? Just be consistent. Okay. Uh, it's obviously in base two log two makes one. Okay. Yeah. This is convenient exactly in quantum information because you don't have all this log two around and you have just one and the maximum entropy is one. Things are easier. And so in fact, in quantum information, you usually use log two. In condensed matter, uh, the natural basis is much more natural for, uh, for other reasons. Because, okay, when you will make contact also with thermodynamic entropy, you have e to the minus beta h, not 2 to the minus beta h. And uh, you know very well that you could have defined also the... You can make thermodynamics with 2 to the minus beta h. This is just a renormalization, a different normalization of the temperature. And, okay. But, but when Boltzmann defined... Uh, yeah, is ensemble defined with A, and so we continue using the natural entropy. If you would have used two, probably we will all use log two. More question? Please don't be ashamed. In the break, I got several questions, and some of them would have been useful also for the other two years, the answer. Now I don't remember all of them, but. It's good if you make, uh, don't be ashamed to be trivial. There is nothing trivial. If you're not understanding, okay, better to ask and not postpone. I prefer to make uh, half an hour less of lecture, but that uh, whatever, the, the other five hour and half will be clear and not uh, to make a lot of things and no one understood anything. Okay, so I made this example on uh, two spin. Since we are talking about many body physics, I should provide that you at least one example of many body physics where things are easy in order to understand what is going on. Okay? And an uh, easy way to think to the entanglement in many body physics, let's, let's think to a many body state. of spin one half always, okay, in which there are many EPR pairs. Okay, what I mean is that, okay, you have this, like imagine they are on a tube D lattice, now that matters where they are. Let's draw many of these spins. Okay, then let's take another color. And the state is such that there are EPR pairs between spins, some close by, some very far apart, okay? But only pairs. There are no stranger objects. Okay, this is a so 
In practice, this state psi is the sum over pairs of the singlet state that we wrote there, OK? That guy there, with alpha equal 1 over square root, uh, with alpha equal pi over 4. Just singlets, OK? EPR pairs, singlets. So plus, minus, 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 plus. I was going to write, OK, in the ij belonging to the pair. This is the state. OK, do you understand what is the state? If not, ask again, because, OK, don't, let's not. Obviously, all the pairs are connected. Eh? It's, you can, I don't have to. This is a very reasonable many body state. And what is the entanglement? Okay, let's choose the bipartition. For example, if I choose this bipartition here. Okay, let me use another color so that it's not doesn't mix up with anything. No, this is. This is the bipartition. It means that the states that are inside are in A, the ones that are outside are in B. Okay? And to, to get the entanglement entropy of this bipartition, I don't hear so far away, yes? What you said? All are paired, yes. Oh, everyone is paired with someone else. I wrote product of pairs, I didn't let anyone alone. Hmm? It's a nice word where everyone is not uh, alone. Okay, so what is the entanglement of uh, this state in this departition? Okay, you have just to, you see that, okay, let's, let's change this one and let's put inside here. Because let's change this too. Let's make like this, okay? You see that, some spin are paired with outside and some not. Okay? So the entanglement between A and B will just depends on how many spin are connected with the outside. Okay? And then since it's a product state, you can just write the entanglement as the sum of the entanglement. So in this very specific case, okay, as A, uh, I am breaking one, two, three, four singlets, and so the entanglement entropy will be in the green case here, as A will be four times log two, because log two is the entanglement of a single, of one pair, but let me take another color. I can as well take this bipartition here orange, okay, and in this case here I'm not cutting anything, anything. I have one, two, three singlet at time breaking, so in this orange bipartition, SA is three log two. Okay, so in general, the entanglement entropy as A is equal to the number of singlet between A and B, let me write here, times log 2. And you see, in this very particular simple basis, how the reciprocity properties between A and B is there. It's the, Singlet between A and B that matters. It's not something only of A or something only of B. Entanglement is always a properties between the two. Okay? Yes? This is not this. <laughs> I was going to ask now, okay, this is not some, uh, uh, just a game uh, to make an example, but it's a very important uh, state in physics. And okay, it's, yeah, it's the valence bond state. So, okay, everyone knows what is a valence bond state, no? If you don't, this is a valence bond state. And so, calculating the entanglement in valence bond state is extremely easy. Uh, that's, this is a new, yeah, okay, this is actually, you can write a, the valence bond state also provides a basis, 
and you can write any status, superposition, et cetera, et cetera, no? And then there is more, uh, the entanglement is more complicated to be calculated, and okay, then it's as difficult as the general case. If you have few terms, okay, you can try to do something, more and more becomes complicated, yes, but it is. And there are people just trying to make this game, huh? it's, it, which is not a game, it's very serious stuff, but okay, it's a combinatoric, uh, it's a way of rewriting the entanglement as some uh, combinatoric game, yes. Yeah, you can, uh, you can make many modifications of the game. You can make that any single pair is less entangled. You can give uh, any pair as some alpha, and then, okay, you just sum up. In any case, in any pair structure, you sum. By the way, this, uh, the, these two questions reminded me a question that I get during the break that I want, whose answer I want to share with you, is that in all these lectures, we will just talk about bipartite entangled. Okay, so I wrote there is a bipartition and I measure the entanglement between a bipartition, etc. Obviously, you may know or you may not know, but it should be quite natural. There is even entanglement that is not bipartite, but it's more partite. Okay, there are, if you have three objects, four objects, you can have something that is uh, uh, that is a property of the tree and is not a property of the various pairs. Okay, this is called tripartite entanglement and is not measured by what is done here, and it's a very interesting line of research that I'm not mentioning, okay? But, so, all the entanglement in these lectures, and actually 99% of the entanglement in condensed matter is bipartite entanglement. More questions? Okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't enter in the entanglement. It just gives zero. Well, okay, obviously. It's a product. A, a, an unpaired object is just, does not enter. Uh, it's a product when you make the resistance matrix. Either is in A either or in B, but doesn't make entanglement. Uh, spin one alpha on the lattice, I see very difficult to move around, but okay. I have a lattice of spin one alpha. You know, don't change the problem. If you change the problem, uh, if you have some itinerant object, obviously you are talking in the wrong basis to write. In a number model, choose another basis to make the game. But, but for understanding what is going on, it's better to think to particles that don't move. So distinguishable particles that don't move, there is no... When you go to it in an object, you have to change basis and things becomes clearer. You don't want a basis that depends on time. <laughs> More question? Okay, if not, now, we try to make content with what you know that is uh, probably condensed matter. Because as you have seen, until now, we play the game of quantum information. That it is, I have a state, I want to know something about the state. Okay, but this is like, Okay, there are many states in the Hilbert space, and some of them you can never uh, meet in your life. So we would like to know, the question is, what happens what happens when dealing with body, many body states
that nature, that nature provides us. Because I can make all the nice math uh, calculation, but this could be related to states that will never be encountered in any of your experiment. Okay? At this point, first of all, we should. Yes? What happens when dealing with state that nature provides us? Not a state just in an Hilbert space. I mean, ground states, thermal states of physical Hamiltonian. Okay? That's where we want to go. But first, before this, we should specify a, the B partition we want to deal with. When you have many body states, you have too many B partition, okay? And we will limit I will write very big because so that you remember we will limit to special B partition. Okay? In which the Hilbert space can be written as always H A tensor H B. But this corresponds to physical space. Okay, so exactly like the lattice that I had before, divided in two parts. Okay, so. You understand what this means, spatial bipartition, no? Now, in the drawing that I've been doing many times, this one, A and B, these are not Hilbert spaces, but are real space. X, X and Y, okay? So this is real space. And there are very good reasons to limit to real space entanglement. Okay? Because the real space is the one where Hamiltonian is local. Okay? It's not a, one of the many possible states. Usually you define a local Hamiltonian in a real space. Okay? And that's uh, the space we want to talk about. We can obviously take other bipartition even in uh, many body systems. Some of them can look interesting, some of them can look a bit less, but we will just limit to this one. Okay? So what happens for the entanglement entropy SA in the ground state of a many body local Hamiltonian? Who knows the answer? Many. No, come on. I don't believe. Who knows the answer? That there is the area law and et cetera, et cetera. Who knows the answer? Not so many. I'm surprised. Hmm? What does it mean it's minimum?
No, there is no, uh, but I'm thinking what happened in the ground state? Eh? It's, this is a question that is around since many times, since many years, and okay, the, it was first proposed in the end of 80s, beginning of 90s, especially by Shrednicki, that the, the entire SA, let's write it, SA should satisfy, satisfy the area law. which means it's proportional to the area of the spatial region separating A and B. Okay? It's proportional to, this is a two-dimensional object. The area separating A and B is a perimeter, okay? and so it should be proportional to the length of this object. It's not, does not scale with volume like standard entropy, okay? which will be additive exactly because of this reason, but it's proportional to the area. Well, that's, I mean, this is, this is a, I say, it's an idea that is going on since the 90s that should, okay, and now you're going ahead, that's slowly. Hmm? What it has been shown, Okay, this, there was this idea, it's been going around for a long time. Okay. Okay, so this is, let's say, from 88 to 93, this is an expectation that was built already in 94 in a seminal paper, Olsen, Larsen, and Wilczek. showed that for a one plus one dimensional conformal field theory, the entanglement entropy is equal to C over 3 log L, where this is A of length L, and this is the remaining of the system. Okay. And you see that the area between A and B in a one-dimensional system is just the number of points between the two parts. So the entanglement, the area should be 2, so it should not scale with L. Instead, here you see that the entanglement entropy is growing with this L, so does not satisfy area law. Follow? No area law. Yes? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm taking a one-dimensional system, a line, and I take an interval of length L, which is special, okay? Uh, can you re-ask this later? And it's, Later on in time, especially during all the notice, so the 2000, several years, okay, people have shown indeed that area law is valid only for gapped Hamiltonian. Okay. There are several arguments to bring that up, and this is rigorously proved even in 1D, okay? So, rigor. 
proved in 1D. It's a theorem from Asting in the 2007. Okay, so the area law is satisfied for gap system, and obviously it follows there are violations. There can be violations, actually, for gapless system. Including the Fermi liquid mentioned by your fellow. Yes? But it's not the For gap system, RLO is satisfied. For gapless system, can be or cannot, there can be, there can be violation. It's uh, quite, okay, I can you make you the story. In one dimension, all conformal field theory will have this form, so bosonic, fermionic, don't, ma uh, don't matter, you will have always violation of the area law. But this, you may know, because in 1D, there is no distinction between boson and fermion, okay? You know this, no? Okay, boson and fermion in 1D is just uh, in our mind, but uh, you can bosonize fermion or you fer fermionize boson, they are completely equivalent, and in fact, the result is the same. In higher dimension, boson and fermions are different, okay? And in fact, it's well known that Fermi liquid and in general fermion, a violation of the area law, Instead, it's bosons, constructed example of bosons still satisfy the area law, even if they are gapless, but can be that someone will not. But, okay. Uh, surely it's not a theorem that uh, they will satisfy the area law. Okay, yes? The gap system, then? The if the gen, ah, okay. Uh, depend if you have finite degeneration, nothing, nothing change. Okay, if you have extensive ground state uh, degeneration, okay, everything. But this is uh, this is a very specific case. Uh, you know what does it mean? Uh, if it's degenerate, just there are two degenerate ground state, three degenerate ground state, nothing. It's just a, this doesn't change area law or not. You have to make a, one more superposition eventually, and this will at most increase the entanglement of log two, log three. And this does not scale with L. Clear? If you have extensive ground state degeneration, you enter into another kind of physics that is, uh, by the way, it's very peculiar and depending on, it's not, uh, it's not standard situation, okay? I think none of you know states with ground state degeneracy, so with extensive ground state degeneracy, so don't, uh, let's not even mention the possibility. Yes? Uh, I will, even because it will be part of the lecture. Uh, I was explicitly asked to make a course in quantum field theory, okay? So, uh, okay, I know that some of you don't have the background there, but, okay, that's what I was asked to do. <laughs> conformal field theory is a uh, field theory, which is also conformal invariance, which means it's, uh, uh, which means it's, in particular, scale invariance, okay? And in practice, for everything that matters, CFT is gapless field theory with dynamical criteria like exponent z equal to one, which means that the energy has a linear dispersion relation. Okay, this is what is a conformal field theory. Dynamical critical exponent, which is the guy that tells you the scaling between energy and momentum, and it in this case is one. If you have E in general equal like could be some dvk k squared, this is not conformal field theory. Okay, is there a, you know what is a dispersion relation? No? The, the, 
relation between energy and momentum. When it's linear, it's a conformal field theory. And this, as you may know, most of one-dimensional theory have linear dispersion relation. What falls in this category? Come on, the expert talks. The CFT includes Exactly, Lattinger liquid. So, so since in 1D, almost everything that is gapless is Lattinger liquid, CFT includes almost everything. Who knows what is a Lattinger liquid? Not too many, okay. Then the organizer should be, give me an, uh, an approximately a sketch of your expertise. Mm -hmm. But a Latinger liquid is the reason why Duncan Aldane got the Nobel Prize last year. So <laughs> you should know why, what it is. Uh, what else? Um, I wanted to tell something, but then the question. Okay, so let's, we, since I don't remember what the observation I wanted to make, we, we continue. Okay, this, this analogy with the area law that uh, I'm writing here, in the 90s, actually, it was uh, uh, mainly motivated by the trying to understand the black hole entropy. You may know that uh, this uh, Begerstein Hawking formula for the entanglement entropy, which says that the entanglement ent the entropy, not the entropy of a black hole satisfies an area law, exactly like the entanglement entropy. And okay, there was the idea, there is still the idea, it depends on the community that the entropy of the black hole is nothing but the, the entanglement that there is between whatever is outside the horizon that is the only part that we can measure and contribute to its thermodynamic entropy and what is inside the horizon that is, uh, as you know, not reachable and if you've seen interstellar, you know uh, what I'm talking about, okay? And, uh, there is a deep connection between what I'm telling here and uh, uh, Begestan Hawking entropy. And this was the motivation why people were studying these things in the 90s, where entanglement was not yet existing. Okay? In the sense, uh, all entanglement monotone and all this idea were just, they were, they've been built much later, and still people were studying this quantity to uh, try to understand the black hole entropy. Okay. Uh. Now, the idea of this lecture for what follows will be the, the following. In, during the next lecture, in all the two hours, I will give you a receipt to calculate the entanglement entropy in a generic field theory. Okay? And this okay, should be accessible to almost all of you that knows what is a field theory. For the other will be bit more complicated and uh, okay even a very low knowledge of field theory and many body system will be enough to understand the first lecture so the next uh, the second lecture that will be tomorrow the last lecture will be a way to understand where this formula comes from which is extremely important and okay to try to explain what is what are this number and what to understand about that guy uh, and this will require some knowledge of conformal field theory that obviously I know that most of you don't have. What I will do, I will, will uh, make the game of the axiom. Okay, you will, I will give you some theorem. Okay, you will believe this theorem. Someone has proved, but you can 
take them as axiom of uh, uh, what I was going to do, uh, I will go to do. We make a derivation of that ideas starting from these theorems that you have no idea where they come from. Some of you, at least, some may have idea where they come from. And uh, if you like the story, then you can go and study uh, where these things come from. Okay? And, um, okay, this is, so, the lecture of tomorrow should be really accessible to everyone. Okay, more or less at the level of what I say today, not much more than that. Uh, okay, and probably I should, I don't know if I have time now. Uh, I should first, let's try just to use this few information that I have given you to motivate, for example, in some cases, why the, entanglement, the study of entanglement and entropy in many body systems became such a central field of research, okay? And you see that this will also help understanding the language in general. We will say that if a system is gapped, the entanglement entropy satisfies the area law, while in one dimension, for example, when it becomes critical or uh, gapless, uh, it, uh, it does not satisfy the area law. Okay, so if I have a, imagine you have a model. Let's take a system undergoing a quantum phase transition. Okay. For me, keep it, keep it in means quantum phase transition. For example, the very famous transverse field dicing model. Okay. Do you know this field, the model, no? Who knows the model? Ah. Okay, so you all know that H equal to one, the model is a quantum phase transition. How do you characterize this phase transition traditionally? Okay, one that answers something, one random one. What you did to say that this model is a quantum phase transition? Hmm? Magnetization, okay, the, the, the most difficult guy you choose. Huh? How do you prove that the magnetization is? Uh, that's, I doubt that when you study the model you, Drop down the magnetization. To, go, to calculate the magnetization in the model, you should calculate the two-point function and the, the, two, the two points to go far away to calculate magnetization. is very difficult, okay? Um, okay, if in this model, now, you consider the entanglement entropy of some B partition, okay, as function of L, what you will have is that if you plot the entanglement entropy as at the critical point, since the central charge of this model is one half, what you will get is that at the critical point, this object asymptotically grows like one over six log L, okay? So this is the curve for H equal one, which is the result of conformal field theory. If you plot the entanglement entropy at another point, for example, at H equal to two, you have that it grows for a bit and then it saturates to a value. Okay, this is H equal to two. You can, if H is closer to one, like 1 1.5, you have that it grows and then it saturates. And if instead it's lower, it, hmm? The one that is plotted there, a subsystem of a length L in an infinite system. If I have an infinite system, where are the boundary conditions? Okay, I'm, in this plot, I have a uh, uh, an infinite system, so to not bother with that. Else, it's minor modification, anyhow, which I hope we'll have time during the last uh, lecture to explain how it goes. 
that's, that's exactly the part that I don't know if I will get there or not, depending on, uh, on the question. So honestly, I hope to not get there. It means that I, uh, you understood something. What? Yes, transfer field has involved, yes? Uh, yeah, that's what I said. This is a prototype example of uh, random phase transition. It's called transverse field icing model. Same story, it's just on this, actually. There is a correspondence between this. Basically the same story. There is an, an, a, uh, the entanglement entropy for H, actually smaller than one is equal to entanglement entropy of SH one over H with H larger than one plus log two. And log two comes from the ground state degeneracy that is because of boundary condition. If you take some boundary condition there is even not that log two. But okay, this is a, a parenthesis that you should not really be interested in. The main point, is that you see that the entanglement entropy is able to characterize very nicely and very easily whether the system is critical or not in this case. Okay, you have this uh, unbounded growth only at the critical point while the growth saturate and actually you can take the entanglement entropy, the saturation value of the entanglement entropy, okay, to define the correlation length, okay. So you say that the entanglement entropy for L large is equal to one sixth log psi and use this formula to define the correlation length of the system, which actually agree with the other one as it can be proved, but I will not have time to get there, okay? But this is a very effective way of ca characterizing the entanglement entropy, much more effective than any other you may know, okay? If you want to measure the entanglement entropy from the decay of the two-point function, good luck. This is very easy state to do even for a model as simple as this one. I don't like, how many of you have ever used a density DMRG or variation of it? Ready some, how many of you know that it exists? Okay. So I can use these words. If you use a DMRG algorithm, the entanglement entropy is a stupid byproduct of your algorithm. You don't have to make any calculation. We are, I should stop, okay. But for a DMRG, you don't make any further calculation to get the entanglement entropy. Your code just has to make one line, if you were not doing it before, to calculate the sum of the weighted eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix, okay? You have just to ask to sum up sum of lambda i log lambda i minus, and this lambda i were already in your code, okay? So getting the entanglement entropy is at zero, uh, is the cheapest thing you can do, and it, for, for example, for the critical system, you tell, for, for a system, one-dimensional system, it tells you automatically whether you are critical or not, which is really a lot of uh, information, okay? And in uh, other circumstances, we'll tell you, like, for example, in 2D, it, uh, understand, it uh, allows you to understand the topological phase where the theory is, et cetera, and many other things. So, Basically, whatever you are doing, the entanglement entropy can be a very good uh, int. And now I remember the comment that I wanted to do, and I forgot, is that uh, okay. since we are studying just the ground state of the Hamiltonian, okay, how the system can know that the Hamiltonian has a gap? So you are just in the ground state. The first excited state is on top of the ground state. You just have your ground state, and still by getting the entanglement Hamiltonian, the entanglement entropy, sorry, you know if the model has a gap or not. And that's quite uh, peculiar, and okay, I will give you the answer tomorrow because uh, I don't want to uh, take more of your time. It's, you have a very small break. So I will stop here, and we continue tomorrow from this point.